Let's stand together as we read God's Word. We're going through this spectacular psalm, Psalm 119. It's the longest psalm in the Bible, so we're doing a whole series on it. And this morning, as we come into this fourth part, I'd like to read verses... Well, I think I'll read it all. I think I'll read verses 57 all the way to 64. And let us stand under God's Word as we hear it. The Lord is my portion. I'm in Psalm 119, verse 57. I have promised to keep thy words. I entreated thy favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to thy word. I considered my ways and turned my feet to thy testimonies. I'm in verse 60. I hastened and did not delay to keep thy commandments. The cords of the wicked have encircled me, but I have not forgotten thy law. At midnight I shall rise to give thanks to thee because of thy righteous ordinances. I am a companion of all those who fear thee. And of those who keep thy precepts, the earth is full of thy loving kindness, O Lord. Teach me thy statutes. Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word. Teach me good discernment and knowledge, for I believe in thy commandments. Verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep thy word. Thou art good, and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. The arrogant have forged a lie against me. With all my heart I will observe thy precepts. Their heart is covered with fat, but I delight in thy law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn thy statutes. And finally, verse 72, the law of thy mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. You may be seated underneath God's word. My wife, Sandra, and I, where we were in Zimbabwe, and some of you may have heard this story before, but if you haven't, here it is again. And we were there with Promise Keepers, and we had done a large conference there in Petrolia, South Africa, and then we did one in Harare, the capital of Zimbabwe, and, and the number of pastors were there. But after the conference was over, we went off to a game preserve way, way in the jungle. And this was out where the great Victoria Falls was crashing down the largest falls after Angel Fall, but the, certainly the largest as far as volume in the world. And you probably have heard me talk about it before. It is 10 times the width of Niagara and twice as high as Niagara Falls, just massive. But we were there in this game preserve. And every evening, the most fascinating thing happened. We were up on a hillside there where the lodge was, and you had to have your windows always shut at night because the monkeys would get in, it really. <laughs> but anyway, but we were there, and in the evening, the most incredible things happened. We were looking down, and down below us was this large watering hole. It was huge, larger than the, this room, about twice the size of this sanctuary here. And this watering hole was down there, and you could see down the slope. And of course, we were there on a huge wall that they had built to kind of protect, I shouldn't say kind of, absolutely to protect us from the jungle, which was all around us. And the evening came on, and as the evening came on, we saw in there on the side of the watering hole, the gazelles began to come closer and closer to the water, and they came down to the water's edge, and all the gazelles, these beautiful, graceful 
animals were there, and they were drinking the water. And then you could hear the earth kind of boom, boom, boom. And the buffalo came in, and the gazelles scattered, you know, after they had had their water. They were out of there, and the huge African buffaloes, and they are fearsome <laughs> with these huge round horns. The, these African buffalo came down to the watering hole, and they drank. And then off to this side over here, I'm pointing to my left, your right, you could hear in the jungle the roar as the lions began to come down. And the lions came down to water there at the edge of this watering hole, and the buffalo didn't run, but they slowly walked away. <laughs> Very proudful, but just like they had something else to do. <laughs> and so they slowly walked away, and the lions were there drinking there from the water. We kept watching, and this whole thing goes on for like an hour, this, this whole drama that was happening below us. It was just the most spectacular thing to watch. And all of a sudden, out in the jungle, we could see the, the trees begin to move, and the earth, boom, 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 and the elephants came down to water. Now, the lions would not budge. The lions would give up no ground. And so when the elephants came down, they went over to the side, and there they drank. But the lions would not move. And they, each in their own territory, <laughs> were drinking. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is so much a picture of the water of God, of the spring of life, that we as the lions of God, we hold our ground, whatever comes. When we move, we're looking for faith. We're looking for strength and power in God. And whatever comes our way, though the whole jungle might rumble, <laughs> we will not give way from drinking God's word. As we open God's Word this morning, I pray that it's living water to us, life to our hearts, and I would encourage you as the people of God, drink from clean, clear water the pure Word of God and give way to no one or nothing. Let's look at verse 57, and I'm reading each of these verses as we go through God's word. It says, the Lord is my portion. I have promised to keep thy words. The Lord is my portion. Now this Hebrew word, kalek, spelled C-H-E-L-E-Q, kalek, it's one of these wonderful words that means smoothness. The Lord is my smoothness, my path, my highway. He's the way clear for my life. It also means inheritance. You have an inheritance. Did you know this? You say, well, I'm not worth very much. But you have an inheritance of heaven. You have an inheritance of God's word. You have an inheritance of the life of Christ. David, who is probably the author of Psalm 119, says, I promise to keep thy words. Again, this Hebrew word is amar, and it means I've determined, I have boasted myself, if you will. So let's read it again using that definition. I have boasted myself that I've kept your words. You know, when you keep the Word of God, you've got to boast. You've got something to be proud of in Him. You really do. Because you have identified yourself with eternity. When you've kept God's Word, you're one with it. It's yours. It's your inheritance, and it's your boast. 58 says, I entreated thy favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to thy word. When it says, I entreated, 
This doesn't mean, now I lay me down to sleep, kind of a prayer, okay? When this scripture, this word entreated, it's an intense word. It's the word that means a woman in travail to give birth. When she's travailing, it's not like, oh, God, looking for a nice day. It's, God, I need you. I need all of you. Who needs all of God? Yeah, me too. We need all of him. We don't need part of it. We don't need a so-so day in God. We need everything that he can give us for this day. Yes, but entreated thy favor with my whole heart. This is a pain prayer. A pain prayer. You can write that down. In other words, it's coming out of something deep within you. I need help with my mom. I need help with my family. Yes, slightly. I need help with my job. I need help. God, I, I need all of you. It's a pain prayer. It's a woman in travail like, oh, God. It says, be gracious to me according to thy word. How this culture has missed God. Oh, when this word gracious, it's the same meaning as a servant looking up to the master and the master stooping to the inferior to help them and to pull them up. People say, well, God and me, we're buddies. <laughs> He's the old Santa Claus in the sky. Pat, pat, pat. Not at all. Not at all. We're, br we're just a breath that's gone. I remember when my dad was dying, he was just a breath away, and finally his breath left him, and he was in the presence of God. This was a man who had led more people to Christ than any man in history, according to Ruth Graham. I mean, he was powerful, but when it came to the end, he was just a breath away from eternity. Look, we're just dust. You know this, right? We're, we're just dust. There's nothing special about us. Only God is great. Say it with me. Only God is great, not us. Now, he will make you great in his word. He will lift you in his word, but only as we recognize who he is and who we are. 59. Let's read it together. I considered my ways and turned my feet to thy testimonies. This word considered is kalshab, spelled C-H-A-S-H-A-B. I'll spell it again for you if you're taking notes. It's C-H-A-S-H-A-B, and it means to value. It means to reckon. There are times for each of us when we need to reckon our lives. Lord, I'm weak in this area. Yes? I need you here. I need you right here. And so we do a reckoning where our weaknesses and what little strengths we have that need to be strengthened more. We reckon our lives. We value our lives. We take account of our lives. And I turn my feet to thy testimonies. Again, this word turned is shub, spelled S-H-U-B. And it means to come back. But even more than that, it means to be pulled in. The Lord will pull you into himself. Now we might sing, and well, we should. Lord, I run to your arms. But we're running to arms that are open. He's going to pull us. You ever, anybody ever felt the pull of God? Oh, the pull of God. It's a wonderful thing. When you may not want to go, but he's pulling you towards himself. He's pulling you into his will. I turn my feet to thy testimonies. Verse 60, and we're doing line on line through the longest psalm in all the psalms, and the longest chapter in all the Bible. Verse 60 says, I hastened and did not delay to keep thy commandments. This word hasten means hurry with excitement. Oh, I think I'll just shuffle over towards God. No, this is talking about hurrying with excitement. You, you know, we get excited about so many things, don't we? We get excited about football, at least I do. But we, we get excited about sports or about a new dress or ma making your third million or what, whatever you're excited about. But here, I hasten and did not delay. I was excited to be excited about God's Word. 
and did not delay. Another neat word in the Hebrew, maha, spelled M-A-H-A-H, and if it's too much Hebrew, well, the Bible was written, the whole Old Testament was written in Hebrew, so there's a lot of Hebrew if you're going to read the Bible. You might read it in English, but it was written in Hebrew, but maha, and it means question. It means to be reluctant. I hastened and wasn't reluctant. I hastened and didn't delay or linger. Well, maybe I'll get around to following the Lord someday. Right. And here the word is right to you and me, that we hasten and not delay. You heard me say this many times before, the fastest way if you've drifted from God, the fastest way is a straight line, boom. Don't worry about all the stuff in between, boom, right to him. I'm getting on with you. Not like I got to get in a good place and then I'll go to church or I got to get in a good place and then I'll be what I need to do or I got to eat the right food or dress the right... No. Boom. Right towards him. I hastened and did not delay to keep thy commandments. 61. The cords of the wicked have encircled me, but I've not forgotten thy word. This word cords... Again, so many of these words in the Hebrew have such huge meanings and important meanings for us. Shelab is this Hebrew word for cords, and it actually means district. District, region, area. The area of the wicked, the region of the wicked have encircled me. Listen, we live in a culture that is away from God. You know this, right? So the cords or the region of darkness, right, have encircled me. You look at me like you've never been to work. <laughs> if you've ever been to a job or you've ever been to work, you've ever been in the world, you know that there's the darkness is all around us in the music, in the commercials, in how people act and treat each other. You ever even driven in your car? <laughs> you can get killed real fast with some guy in a bad mood, right? He's going to run you right off the road. But that's the cords of the wicked have encircled me is what's going on here. I have not forgotten thy law. This word forgotten, it's a long Hebrew word, so I won't give it to you, but I'll just tell you the meaning of it. It means to be oblivious of. You know, you go through your day and you say, well, you know, I'll figure out what I'm supposed to do on Sunday or tonight when I get around to reading the Bible or I might have some time to pray maybe next week. But here it says, I have not forgotten thy word, not oblivious to it, is there any time when God's word isn't stronger than another time? Of course not. It's always his God's word, whether you feel it or not. Aren't you glad he's consistent? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's consistent in our lives all the time. Now, we may not feel him. We may not see him. We may not understand him. But he's there. 62, at midnight, I shall rise to give thee thanks. Because of thy righteous ordinances. At midnight I shall rise to give thanks to thee because of thy righteous ordinances. This word midnight is kosta, and it means middle of the night, but more specifically it means night season. Every Christian, if you walked with God for more than a day or two, are going to have night seasons in your life. It just is a fact. There are going to be seasons of midnight, seasons of darkness, seasons of difficulty that you as the believer need to live out and walk through, but not alone, not alone with him. But it says, I will rise to give thanks to thee. Oh, that we as the people of God would rise to give thanks to him in the middle of the midnight, in the middle of the night season. God, I don't know why this is happening to me. I don't know why my daughter's going through this. I don't know why 
my mother is dealing with this. I don't know what's happening with my son. I don't know what's happening with my friends. But I believe in you, and I'm going to trust you with everything I have. Because of thy righteous ordinances. 63. I'm a companion of all those who fear thee and of those who keep thy precepts. This beautiful word, companion, spelled in the Hebrew, C-H-A-B-E-R, kaber. It means knit together. You know, God has knit us with other believers. Are you aware of this? I, I mean, you can... And my, my wife and I, we've been all over the world. <laughs> and and we, we find believers wherever we go. And when we do, we feel a sense of being knit to them. You, you don't have to go to church with them every day. You just, you sense, man, this is a sister. This is a brother in Christ. There's something supernatural that has linked us together. I'm a companion of those who fear thee and those who keep thy Precepts. 64. The earth is full of thy loving kindness, O Lord. Teach me thy statutes. This word earth, eretz, spelled E R E T S, eretz. And it means field and wilderness, but it also means nations. The nations are full of the loving kindness of God. What does this mean? This means whether you're going into central Mexico, where I've been to, or central Africa, where we've been, or central Asia, or wherever you, wherever you have been, Singapore, wherever you go, you can find the loving kindness of the Lord. I was in an elevator in Jerusalem, and I stepped in this elevator, and it was packed with rabbi. <laughs> I was packed with rabbi, and one of them muttered under his vo- voice, Gaim, which means Gentile, right? Gaim, because I had stepped into the elevator with, he didn't know about my background, my Jewish background with my grandfather. But nevertheless, there we were, and I was going, God. And you know, in the middle of that elevator with all those rabbis, I could feel the loving kindness of God. Is there a place? where his loving kindness cannot penetrate? Never is there any place, nowhere is there any place where the loving kindness of God cannot penetrate. Teach me thy statutes. Again, this word statutes, koki in the Hebrew, and it means customs. There are customs in the kingdom of God. Are you aware of this? (laughs) It, it, yeah, it doesn't include adultery. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't include lying and stealing. There's customs that we as the people of God are meant to walk in. There's, there's a whole way that we're meant to walk in. The usage, another meaning of this word, the usage of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has certain customs and usages that do not include darkness and sure does encompass all of the light of God. This next section, Teth. We're going through the alphabet, the 22 letters of the alphabet in Hebrew, and that's what David did. He did eight verses on each of the letters, and each of those lines or verses had the same letter in the beginning in the Hebrew. Nevertheless, you know, we were in Jordan on one of our many worldwide trips. And we were there going on horseback towards Petra. And this is called the Red Rose City. Petra, of course, means the rock. Never forget winding our way down this little path. It was about this wide, right? About a yard on each side of us. About big enough for the horse, not much room for our legs, you know. But we're riding on this horse, and we're looking up at this red rock that rose, I don't know, 80, 100 feet above us on both sides. We're walking through this passageway through the rock. 
Many believe this is where some of the, or most of the 144,000 in Revelation will hide out someday. We'll see. Soon we'll find out from the persecution of the beast. But nevertheless, we were on our way through the rock until we finally came out to a broad place. The rock of our life, the Petra, if you will, of our life is the Word of God. Nowhere else will you find that standing rock. Nowhere else will you find that place of security. You're not going to find it in your family. You're not going to find it in your job. You're not going to find it in money. You're not going to find it in food. You're not going to find it in lust. You're not going to find it anywhere else except the rock of His Word. That's where we find the stability, the strength, and the glory. Verse 65, Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word. Again, this word dealt literally means journey. Thou hast journeyed well with thy servant. You say, well, I feel alone. You're not. Aren't you glad? You're not. On this journey of life, you say, I just got a long trip, right? On this journey of life, he's with you. He's with us, yes? He's with us every step on this journey. You have dealt well with thy servant. O Lord, according to thy word. This word according in the Hebrew is men, M-I-N, and it means by reason of. But it also means more than. <laughs> you know, when the Bible says he'll richly bless you, you know, you're not going to be able to handle the blessing that's coming your way. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, how many times have you been to heaven? Well, when, when you get there, you're going to go, man, this was even better than I ever thought. This was even fuller. Just to be with Jesus, right? Would you rather be with him for 10 minutes or 10 years here? 10 minutes. Let's just go for the 10 minutes with Jesus. Ah, oh, it's better. It's beyond. And this is what it's talking about, according to thy word, more than I could have even expected. Verse 66, teach me good discernment and knowledge, for I believe in thy commandments. Good discernment. This word discernment, it means understanding, but it also means taste good. <laughs> it means, oh, that tastes good. That, that, that seems good. I, I got discernment that that you love the Lord and, and you're following him and you have faith. It, it tastes good to me when I'm, when I'm with you and when I, we fellowship together. Well, you know, God is good. He's so good and he's good all the time. Taste and see the Lord is good. Say it with me. Taste and see the Lord is good. Absolutely. Taste, discernment, knowledge, this word knowledge, good discernment and knowledge. <laughs> this word knowledge, in the Hebrew here, it means known of God. Known of God. You know, he knows all things. He knows everything. He knows your last breath. He knows when you were born. You don't need to tell him, right? He knows your birthday. He knows how long you have. Known of God. You know, that's a comforting thought to think that God is at one time seeing the beginning and the end. He sees the whole deal. I was talking to somebody this morning and, and, and I was saying, you know, just hang in there. He sees the end. <laughs> this particular guy was, was wrestling with some stuff and I said, hey, he sees the end. He has knowledge of the final chapter of your life and of the life of the church. Knowledge known of God, for I believe in thy commandments. Again, this word believe means to foster up or raise up. Same word as if you had a foster child, right? And you're raising them. What am I saying in this? What is the word saying? It's more important than what, what pastor is saying. I believe in thy word. 
I foster up. In other words, you want to cultivate and strengthen God's Word in your life. You say, well, I know a couple of scriptures, and I know some of God's Word, but you want to foster it up. You want it to grow in you. You want to be increased. This is why I so often we'll say something about the Word, and we'll repeat it together. <laughs> Thy word is life. Try it with me. Thy word is life. Thy word is truth. Say it with me. Thy word is truth. Absolutely. Thy word is everlasting. Thy word is everlasting. To foster it up and bring it on. Verse 67. I'm getting there to the end of this chapter. Stay with me another few minutes, if you will. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. You know i got to go after this word afflicted. Before I was afflicted, it means weakened. It means humbled self. And the root meaning in the Hebrew there was before I began to speak. You know, a child is going to learn how to speak from their parents. It's the most amazing thing to see Spanish parents raising up kids. They end up speaking Spanish. They don't usually speak German. They, they, they speak Spanish. And, and, and so they, they come on. You know, they, if, when they're little, if they've been taught Tagalog all their life, they, they learn Tagalog, and they can speak it right. So we, as his people, before I was afflicted, before I was weakened, before I even began to speak... I went astray, and God was teaching me and having me learn about him. But I keep thy word. Say it with me. I keep thy word. Absolutely. This word keep, again, so many meanings in the Hebrew. It's just wonderful. It's like it means a hedge around of thorns, right? Protection. Lord, I love your word. I'm going to protect it. No one's going to take it from me. I'm putting your word around me. It's a protection. It keeps the enemy away. And by the way, it keeps me in both ways, right? Keep thy word narrowly. You say, boy, you have an awful narrow view of life. It's all about the Bible. Well, you know, I, I think that God's word is a path and it's a narrow path. It's a straight path but it will keep you. 68, thou art good and dost good. Thou art good and doest good. This word art good is tobi, which is an adjective. Thou art good. But I love this word because it's so deep. It means beautiful. It means fair. It means loving. It means pleasant. Thou art loving. Thou art pleasant. Thou art joyful. Thou art precious. All of these adjectives, all these meaning is in this word. Thou art beautiful, fair, loving, pleasant, joyful, precious. So that's who God is. And thou doest good. This means to make better. This means to make well. It means to make cheer. When people are around you, right, you want to be making cheer, right? <laughs> so when I say hi to you, right, make cheer. You're making joy. You're affecting people. Do you know we affect each other? We really do. And we want to be making that effect positive and good and making whole and making cheer and making complete. 69, the arrogant have forged a lie against me. Have forged a lie against me. This word forged, this is the only time in the whole Bible this word is used. It's only used right here. In Psalm 119, verse 69, forged, and it means put a patch on, slap a patch on, P-A-T-C-H, patch. Satan wants to put a patch on us that we're hung up or that we're no good or that we're a problem or put a patch on our church, and he's forged a lie 
or he has concocted a lie. He has put a patch on you. But that patch is worthless before God and worthless before his kingdom because you are clean and righteous and whole and complete in Jesus Christ. Isn't that a nice thought? It's a wonderful thought. Forged. With all my heart I will observe thy precepts. This word all, kol, K-O-L in the Hebrew, and it means every place, everything, everyone, With my everything, I will observe thy precepts, right? With my all, I will observe thy precepts. Verse 70, their heart is covered with fat. This is a disgusting word, by the way, and I'll get to it in a second, this word fat. Their heart is covered with fat. By the way, David never minced words, did he? (laughs) If you've ever read the... You know, all the Psalms of David, read the impeccatory Psalms. Oh, my goodness. But anyway, but I delight in thy law. Their heart is covered with fat. The King James is pretty good on this. As fat as grease. There's a grossness in the meaning of this word fat. Their heart is covered with grossness or grease. But I delight. In thy law. (laughs) Again, delight. It's a word, sha'ah, and it means amuse myself. Wow. You know, we have so much amusement in our culture, don't we? Everybody's looking to be amused and be entertained. You ever thought about the word of God? Is your amusement and your joy and your light and your goodness, I think I'll just enjoy God's Word, right? I'll just let it amuse me. I'm just really enjoying it fully and wholly and completely. I delight in thy law. The root meaning of this word delight means to divide. Divide. Light, darkness, good, Evil, right? Divide. Are you aware that the Word of God divides? It does. It'll divide your own heart, you from your sin. You want to be divided from your sin, but it will divide. Verse 71, it is good that I was afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. It was good for me that I was afflicted. Again, this word afflicted. We just finished hearing it once, and we'll hear it later in the chapter on another Sunday. But it, it's one of these wonderful words, that this word afflicted. I, I can never get to the bottom of these words because there's just so much. But it has a duality to its meaning. My wife and I were talking about this at 6 this morning. We're talking about the duality of this meaning, afflicted. And, and it means deal hardly, deal hardly. And it also means gentleness. Sometimes God is very gentle with us and will softly pull us back to him. And then we're responding. Other times we can resist him, right? And he can be firm, even to the point of dealing hardly with us. He's a big God. You're aware of this, right? He's a wonderful and huge God, and he will deal with you and me just as we need at any point in our life, sometimes firmly, sometimes gently, but always faithfully, that I may learn thy statutes. Lamad is the Hebrew, that I may learn thy statutes. This has the meaning of goad, right? Goad. It can even mean rod, that I might learn thy statute. Sometimes he has to prod you on, doesn't he? (laughs) He does. And sometimes thy rod doth comfort me. Sometimes the staff, sometimes the rod. Same author, David, same writer, the Holy Spirit. 72, the last verse I'd like to do today is the law of thy mouth is better to me 
in thousands of gold and silver pieces. The law of thy mouth. This word mouth in the Hebrew means blowing, blowing, breath. God breathed into the dust in Adam and he became a living spirit. The breath of God will breathe on his own and will change us to a living being. You know, you wonder when people are not born again, they seem dead, and indeed they are. But when they become born again, before they're born again, they're dead, but when they become born again, they're breathed on and become life. This word pay for mouth, it also means double-edged. The mouth of God is double-edged. It's a sharp and double-edged sword. It also means mind. Oh, to have the mind of Christ Jesus. I desire the mind of Christ Jesus. Say it with me. I desire the mind of Christ Jesus more than thousands of gold and silver pieces. If you're thinking about thousands of gold pieces, you're talking about multiple millions of dollars. The mouth of God, the breath of God is more valuable than stacks of silver and stacks of gold. In other words, all the money in the world couldn't buy one breath of God. The law of thy mouth is better to me, say it, than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Let's stand together as we read God's Word. We're going through this spectacular psalm.